So it is a great pleasure to have uh, Catarina Cardoso with us today. Catarina is Portuguese Chilean. I just found out that she's half Chilean. She is, um, Catarina has a very interesting background in geography and economy. She studied economics at the Universidade Nova in Lisbon in Portugal. And then he did, uh, she did geography at the University of Cambridge and her PhD at the, at the Department of Geography in the London School of Economics. So it's a very interesting blend of economics and, um, and, uh, and geography. Right now, she's focusing more on energy policy and institutional, environmental and behavioral economics, which is another fascinating topic. But she's here with us today because Catarina published this book titled The Extractive Reserves in Brazilian Amazonia, which is, I think, the best source in English on the Brazilian extractive reserves, is, if any one of you is interested in learning more about them. And, um, and it's a great um, example, I feel, of how a forest can be managed sustainably, but at the same time, you know, provide a community-based economy and preserve the forest and actually maybe even enhance it. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have you with us, Katarina. We would love to learn more about what you have learned about the extractive reserves and also what future you see for them. And with that, you know, I'm going to um, let you uh, share your screen. I'm going to mute myself. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It is a real pleasure to be able to be here. And um, I hope um, I can share the screen. Let me just try. Hello, can you, um, I can only see the screen now. I can't see anybody else. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. you. Thanks well, for letting me know. And can you also see the slides? We, no. we, we cannot see the slides yet, sorry. I should realize okay, that we're because here there was a blank for a while and I couldn't see anything. And now I only see the slides. Do you mind if we just wait maybe for a minute to see if they show? Oh, that's strange. You let me see. You so see you already there? shared your you shared your screen already? Uh yeah. Oh, because I I can't see your screen. Can anyone okay, else see the just, screen? Okay. No? I'll just I'll just do it again. I've just done escape. Okay. Okay. I did try it out before early on, so I'll just. And in the um, meantime, I'll make sure that you are co-host and that you are being able to share it. Uh, yes. It says here one participant can share at the same, or one participant can share at a time and all participants can share. So that should be fine. Okay, now we can see it. Perfect. Uh, okay, I think the problem might be if I actually put it on, on, um, on slideshow. Let's see. Yeah. If you press that, can you still see? We can see it perfectly oh, well, brilliant. Katarina. That's wonderful. Okay, Thank that's you so much. Really good. No problem. So, um, okay, so I'll get started so that everybody has uh, time to talk and questions and everything else. So um, what I want to discuss here is really about um, some observations based on uh, the research and, and the book uh, about the linkages between local resource management and global environmental issues. And these global environmental issues being at the time it was deforestation and it was the start of the concerns about climate change. Um, it's quite interesting because at the time, the whole thing about greenhouse gases was still talked about, but only a few people knew about it. It didn't have the same sort of wide public support that it has now. But deforestation was very big, and so was um, uh, biodiversity as well. 
So um, I'll let me just go to the next. Yeah. So uh, this is basically just to show you. Oops, sorry, okay, just got the wrong. Here, let me see. I can. Can you see my cursor here? Yeah. Okay. So basically, so um, this is just to show where. So this you can see um, Brazilian Amazonia is. Uh, you can see the line here that separates from uh, other countries, and Rio Branco is here. And so the reserve where I did the research is the extractive reserve Chico Mendes, and which is in the state of Acre. This here is the state of Acre, and is somewhere there, just to locate. There are about 75 reserves in, in Brazil. So um, this research was done a long time ago. I found this picture um, in a box and um, no digital camera. So, but I just put it there to give you an idea of how the forest, uh, I don't know how many of you have been in, in the forest, but uh, it is pretty amazing. And um, after a while you find your way around, but the path, as you can see, this is a path, you can hardly see anything. So this is sort of the light that's coming from there. And this is the path. And um, I couldn't find one with the rubber trees, but the ones with the rubber trees are not too different. And uh, so the rubber tappers need to basically walk through here and they will know where they are. And I'll talk a bit more about how they are organized and everything. So my work was very much based on the theory of um, collective action and institutional choice, Eleanor Ostrom. So while other researchers, they talk more about um, the politics and, um, and, um, and actions so of polit uh, political aspects of it, this is very much focused on the institution. So how property rights institutions are developed, um, whether common property rights institutions are sustainable or not. Now, because this theory tends to focus very much on the resource and on the use of the resource, I also looked at the literature on environmental action and participation, which looks more about how local communities interact with the wider socioeconomical context. So, um, this is based on is a case study uh, approach in which I was for about five months uh, in the Amazon, traveled to the attractive reserve Chico Mendes, interviewed rubber tappers quite extensively, and then also had some expert interview with national, um, uh, regional, and local policymakers. Um, so I'll talk about first. I'm going to talk about. Uh, um, a combination of factors, the characteristics of the resource um, itself. And I, I think something element, is wrong because I can hear my recorded voice. With global environmental issues such as deforestation. I'm trying to figure out what happened. So the rubber tappers have been within. It the says to do, do, do oh. When they migrated from other regions of Brazil to work on larger rubber uh, states, someone okay. has the microphone open or something i'm not sure how to control this maybe okay i think it's stopped now i'm sorry about that katarina yeah i can still hear it though i'm sorry i can still hear it and what what caused that i'm trying to figure out like i'm looking at the Everyone has the microphone off right now. Let me see if I stop my microphone. I think that maybe there's a recording in your computer that was turned on by mistake, probably. Now we can't hear it anymore. Okay. All right, um, apologies about that. So let me just um, go back. So, yes, yeah, so I, as I said, so I'll talk um, a little bit about the rubber tappers and the development of the reserves. Then I talk about how is the structure in the extracted reserve she um, And then I'll go straight in a way to the conclusions, which is the interaction of local, national, and international factors. Um, so, um, so the rubber tappers uh, basically is, has they've always been uh, embedded in a wider context, and they arrived in the Amazon in the late 1800s uh, in the context of the the rubber boom. 
So basically at the time there was a considerable demand for LaTeX, especially for the automobile industry. And, um, and so people from the Northeast of Brazil, usually um, poor peasants without land, they arrived in the Amazon and started working in very large rubber states under systems of uh, debt peonage. So basically uh, they were like semi-slaves in a way, slaves because of the debt they had. Now, uh, in the 1920s, um, it was the end of the rubber boom for an interesting reason, which was that um, rubber plantations started to develop in Southeast Asia. So they had tried to develop rubber plantations in the Amazon, uh, but they, they, it was not possible because of the environmental, uh, there was <clears throat> basically um, a plant that just, um, ju it just didn't work, um, a plant fungus. But the thing is that uh, this plant fungus was not in, uh, in East Asia, so there they could have the plantations and plantations were much more profitable. So with this was the end of the rubber boom and many rubber, uh, many the rubber barons left uh, many rubber tappers left as well, but um, others actually stayed by themselves, um, quite forgotten really, because at the time the Brazilian government was not that interested in the Amazon. And they started developing their own institutional arrangements to manage the forest. And so between 1920s and the 1960s, they were very much left to their own devices. They started developing common property based on the same system of uh, the rubber state. Now, in the 1960s, um, government policies uh, attracted newcomers to the region, not just cattle ranchers, but also um, um, people in search of, of land because land was freely available. Roads were opened very close to what is now the extractive reserve Chico Minch, which, which basically saw the result of the rubber state being made more accessible and also um, there being so many incentives for more um, uh, other kind of economic activities led to um, many people arriving there and sort of, um, and also uh, acquiring legal property rights because the rubber tappers did, did not have legal property rights while the newcomers, they often did. Um, and um, so you had a huge conflict, very, very violent uh, in which many rubber tappers just left because they felt they didn't have the rights to the land. And those that stayed were often expelled at gunpoint. So it was very, very violent. Now in about the 1970s, mid 1970s, started a peaceful movement of resistance, the standoff, uh, which actually saved uh, large amounts of, of forest. I'm thinking if I have here the, the number. Um, this strategy was very good. So for example, one reference is that they basically about 1 million of hectares were saved just through these standoffs in which rubber tappers will just stand and basically would not move until um, the, the people working for the new, uh, for the cattle ranches would leave. Then in the 1980s, you have the global um, interest or international interest in environmental issues. Uh, and deforestation becomes very important. Um, there are some reports published, like one, for example, that says that the Amazon contributed 5% of carbon emissions. So there is concern with climate change. Uh, there is a biodiversity, there is a rights of local people. There is a different perception of local communities. They are not universally seen as a destruction, as the destructors of the environment anymore. Uh, but there is more and more voices that say, well, actually they help preserve nature, which is um, of global value. So all in all, we have then basically the creation of the first extractive reserves in 1990. And then there are four phases through this. And uh, in total, as I'm saying, there are about 75 extractive reserves nowadays, uh, some of them federal, some of them state reserves all over Brazil. So this is the background. Now here, um, I wanted to show you this map. It was really difficult to get at the time, um, I remember. And, uh, and now this time trying to take the picture and make it look good was again a, a challenge. So I've made it a bit bigger because what I want to show you here is that um, basically, so this is the extractive reserve, as you can see, very large area. 
And the reserve is formed by several rubber states. So these were the former rubber states that were created in the late uh, 19th century. So each rubber state has about 130 to 700 square kilometers and with a high concentration of rubber trees. Now, each rubber state, here you've got the names of some of the rubber states. Now, uh, these rubber states, the, there's these limitations here, basically they are um, just on paper. In the forest, you can't really see the difference between two rubber states, they look exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> and they can be jointly used by several individuals but only as long as um, the activities are, don't uh, require the removal of the forest cover. So in that sense, they are common pool resources. I don't know how familiar you are with the term, but um, common pool resources are basically resources that can be used jointly, but only up to a certain point. So not like public goods that can be used jointly point. They can be used jointly, but only up to a certain point. And they are normally very large, so exclusion is not impossible, like in the case of a public good, but it is quite difficult. So you have joint use and uh, up to a point and ex exclusivity problems. Now, the, so these forests can be used jointly, and um, if, but if too much latex is ex um, extracted, basically the tree will dry up. So you need to also leave the trees rest, they need to have some periods of rest. Uh, the rubber tappers, they walk along the trails, making cuts in the trees, and then later collect the latex. So each rubber tapper in one of these states and now in the reserve, uh, they basically will have several rubber trails, which are the trails where they walk collecting the rubber. They'll have a stand, uh, they have an area to process the rubber, and they'll have a house, and these the, the rubber stand. The trails are intertwined with each other, uh, so you can't really divide them, uh, but the rubber tappers know perfectly well which trails belong to whom, and the, trades they, and the trails can be traded. They are not defined in terms of area, they are defined in terms of the number of trails and the quality of the trails, the rubber trails. Um, so basically it is uh, indivisible, the, the, the area. So if we now look at the reserve, we then have a common pool resource um, in which it is possible but difficult to exclude people from the reserve. So the boundaries don't correspond to a natural boundaries uh, and they are not boundaries established by an informal institution because the institution was the rubber state and uh, this extracted reserve has several rubber states. So there is no natural, um, a natural boundary or cultural boundary uh, is relatively arbitrary in a way. And the reason for having such a large area was because when the rubber tappers were fighting for their rights, they basically wanted to have uh, protect other areas from being exposed to the same situation. So they asked to have as much as possible inside the reserve, protecting fellow tappers who had not participated in the struggle. Um, the rubber tappers can they, the trails are individual, you can say they are private property, but of course they can't cut them, cut the trees off. So they are private property as long as they use them sustainably. Um, and um, one thing is interesting as well is that the rubber tappers basically, they leave, they are quite isolated and they are very concerned with their own state rather than the, for the area as a, as a whole. So there is a mix of uh, a community feeling, but at the same time, this is my land kind of feeling that you would find in other places. So both coexist. So this is uh, to describe the, the area. Now, uh, I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, Anna, I think. We, we started like 10 minutes late, so I would say 10 more minutes. Okay, okay, although that's brilliant actually. Okay, so um, I think <clears throat> in terms of my thoughts about this, just yes yeah, so um i basically so the, if, if you have the opportunity to read the book there is there is a chapter which explains how um local national and international factors uh interacted to in the development of the reserve 
And then there is another section, which is how they all interact in the current characteristics of the resource, of the reserve. I couldn't go into the detail here, which is why um, I'm just talking now about basically the, the conclusions. So uh, based on this research, I think one of the key points is really that the relationships between the local communities and the external context is not limited to a dispute over resources. So I think at the time I did the research, it was very much that um, you had local communities defending. Uh, so you had two sides. You had the one, the tragedy of the commons, local communities cannot manage their own resources. And then you had the other side that would say, well, local communities can manage their own resources and it is um, uh, those coming the outsiders who actually destroy the, the resource. Looking at the extractive reserves, it's very clear that actually the relationship is much more complex than that. So the rubber tappers could not have developed their extractive reserve, for example, without, first of all, support uh, on the ground from, uh, from the church, the Catholic church, a priest from the liberation theology helped very much in terms of, uh, for example, setting schools, in terms of uh, teaching about uh, social action. Uh, there was a union, which is sort of partly rubber tappers, but partly union from outside the, the reserves. Um, then later you have basically um, international agents as well, who um, they help in terms of, for example, campaigning for some development projects that were, um, um, were quite damaging for the rubber tappers for them to stop. So by themselves, the rubber tappers could not have developed an extractive reserve and they couldn't have had um, uh, the, the protection they have now. So that was very important. And in terms of their development, the same thing. So um, on one hand, the development is related to the fact that there was demand for rubber, which is what brought them to the area in the first place. Um, the end of the rubber boom, basically the start of uh, rubber plantations as well, meant that they were able to develop their own, um, uh, their own institutions. Um, a second factor that is very important in the establishment of the reserve is the actual characteristics of the resource. So the forest is quite unique in the sense that it is indivisible. So you can have different rubber trails, but at the end of the day, the forest as an ecological area cannot be divided. The moment you start taking out one part of it, the rest also gets affected. So it is indivisible. So it's not just that it provides a, um, an environmental service worldwide is also the fact that the forest itself on the ground, you can't really divide it. The resources are also, for example, water, um, all the rubber tappers in a different stand, they may use the water from the same place. Uh, the same thing with um, um, fruit trees. So the, the characteristic, the individual visibility of the forest is really very important. Um, the regional context and the international trends. So um, one thing, for example, things like the start of democracy uh, in Brazil um, and also the setting up of governmental agents with a very genuine interest in the protection of, of uh, these communities and in the protection of the Amazon, again, played a big role uh, in the area. Now, in terms of the future and the sustainability of the reserves, Yes, to a large extent, it depends on the capacity of these institutions to set up the rules and um, um, various mechanisms necessary, like conflict resolution mechanisms, monitoring mechanisms, um, which basically ensure the sustainable use of the resource. And at the time I was there, these mechanisms were not very strong. So you had a common property institution, um, but the mechanism in terms of making sure that if there is a problem, how it is addressed, they were not very strong. The rubber tappers were living in a sort of, let's say, weak common property organization. And they were outsiders trying to encourage them to develop stronger rules and, and stronger mechanisms. But the thing is that these kind of things, they really need to come from the community. Outsiders can help, but if they develop them for them, they then the users themselves cannot adapt these rules. But the sustainability also of the reserves also depends on the economic opportunities available to the tappers. Uh, so the external context again, and this is really essential. 
And um, I did some reading in preparation for this about what's happening right now. And it's quite interesting, but basically the rubber tapas before it was mostly rubber and um, Brazil nuts, and now they've actually diversifying and they have small cattle ranching, for example. Um, and they also basically they, they start to have, and there are some areas which are um, uh, used for ranching and used for other kinds of products. They've tried um, fruit, but many of the fruit is quite difficult because uh, it's not something that you can, um, you need fridges basically. And if you don't have fridges, it's very difficult. You need to transport them while they are still fresh. So it is quite limited in that sense. So um, my other uh, thought about this was basically about the role of the state. So the state plays an absolutely key role uh, in the survival of common property regimes. Just leaving them to their own devices uh, is, is, is basically it's very rare that they would be able to, um, to survive, at least, especially when you have communities that actually they are to some extent integrated in international commerce. They don't live in isolation. They've never lived in isolation. They depend on international demand for their products. They depend on um, their ability to, um, to, um, to develop economic activities that will uh, help them move out of poverty. So um, another thought is about that the rubber tappers, I remember when, when I studied, was quite interesting because they were very popular and the Amazon is very popular, but there were a number of cases of other communities also impacted by international development, but without the same level of popularity because their resources are well less well known. Um, and then finally, I think I'd say that the conservation of the commons, I think, depends also on local users' ability to adapt to the changing external context. So in the 80s, the international interest in the Amazon was very beneficial for them. Um, and uh, yes, the, the international the context now is different and their ability to adapt to that and to be able to be savvy like they were at the time um, will, I think, will play a big role in terms of their, their future. So just to uh, finish, so these are some current articles about extractive reserves. Uh, I can send them to Ana Maria so you can have a, a, a copy. Um, so this one is in Portuguese, uh, but this one is in English and this one as well. Uh, they're all, they're all very, uh, very interesting, um, particularly this one, actually. And just to finish, I just want to show this picture. Uh, there are two pictures, actually, which basically is, um, so uh, yeah, so basically is the, the rubber tappers at the time. So this will be the house in the stand. And um, yeah, these are two different houses. So um, the population uh, has slightly reduced. Um, it may be because some people are leaving, but it also may be because um, there is the natality, uh, fewer births. So that's also a, a reason. And, um, and yes, and they fight facing some economic difficulties, different from 20 years ago, but they still do. Anna, I think that's about the time, right? Perfect. Thank you so much, Katarina. Very, very interesting. You're welcome. I'm going to give you one of these uh, Facebook claps. And um, I see that Chochi is already here. So okay. I guess that- I'll just take this out, yeah. Thank you so much, Catalina. That was wonderful. Very, very interesting. We will definitely discuss Thank it you. at the end. Some important topics here. Uh, and then- um, uh, I'm going to try to stop sharing, yeah. There, we can okay. see you there right now. I'm going to go back here to the- Chochi, are you there somewhere in the matrix? Yes, there you are. I can see you I now. Am. Hi. How are you? Welcome, <laughs> dear Chochi. Um, Hi, thank you. Chochi is an Ecuadorian entrepreneur. Uh, she basically has been working for how long, Chochi, in Humans for Abundance? Since 2019. Since 2019. Mm -hmm. But basically, Chochi has uh, started, she, basically, she created a startup called Humans for Abundance that uh, provides uh, eco-services and she's uh, supporting communities that are working on forest resurgence and other programs that have to do again with the community, with the creation and uh, sustainable perpetuation of community-based eco-services. Um, and uh, what she's doing is, is fabulous. I know that firsthand. So Chochi, welcome. And um, please, are you going to show some slides? Would, would you like to share the screen? 
Yes, I okay. think so. I'm going to make sure. Can, let me see here. I'm going to make sure you're a co-host. Okay, my co-host. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. let's, let's try it. Perfect, right. we can see it, yeah. There yeah. you go, Rosa. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ahí puedes ver, yeah? Yes, perfectly well, thank you. Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Maria Jose Turralde, my nickname Chochi. I am uh, an Ecuadorian entrepreneur, as uh, Ana Maria said. Thank you, Ana Maria, for inviting me. And um, we set up this social entrepreneurship called Social uh, Humans for Abundance with the idea of um, doing ecological restoration, which is different from reforestation, right? Ecological restoration, which means to bring back the whole ecosystem back, uh, to bring back the ecosystem with all its biodiversity in the Amazon rainforest or, or beginning in the Amazon rainforest. We also do a little bit in the Andes with the native forest there, but we're just beginning. Um, which means bringing back everything, all the flora and all the fauna. So uh, it's quite tricky getting the seeds because you know we're not just bringing certain one kind, one type of tree is in certain hundreds of types of tree or or species. So uh, Ana Maria asked me to share what is it that we do, um, and then if we work with indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest. So I thought I would present it from the point of view of Rosita, Rosa. Um, and show her, show you guys her community and what they're going through and what is it that we're doing with them uh, through their point of view. So uh, the idea is to use ancestral knowledge to do the ecological restoration. So indigenous people know <laughs> or have known for millennia how to do, how to keep the forest alive and the soil alive, especially. So um, we we found when we when we started doing this project that colonialism and oppression, like so many so many centuries of colonialism and oppression had uh, instilled an idea or a belief in the indigenous communities that they their methods were useless and that the Western ways were superior. So they've been forgetting and forgetting and using less and less uh, of their knowledge about how to keep in the forest and use more and more of traditional agriculture. Um, so, so this is what's happening in the, in the Amazon. So let me tell you a bit more about Rosita. Rosita lives in, uh, in the Sumaco area near the, one of the most biodiverse volcanoes that we have uh, in the world, actually. <laughs> um, and she lives under the line of poverty, according to, to our economic standards, right? Even though she has like 25 hectares of forest, I think yeah, she manages. Um, she doesn't produce enough food to live um, a healthy life, you know, with well-being. Uh, her family is uh, I don't know, has all the, the pressures from, from the outside, uh, from extractivism, and they suffer a lot from uh, nutritional, uh, how do you say, well, they, they don't have a very uh, nutritious uh, meals. They only, when we entered four years ago, they only harvested yucca and plantain um, and a few other things like uh, peanuts and pineapple, but they didn't, they didn't have a, a system for growing food in a healthy way. They, they would just cut the forest because this is what the government told them to do. Uh, they were forced by the government to actually, uh, the government would say you have to use your land or work your land, um, otherwise they will take it away. So to work the land mean, meant to actually clear the forest and plant some sort of monocrop culture. So this is what uh, Rosita does. And she has all these pressures from the outside and her family. Uh, this is a satellite image from her community uh, and other families that work with us. As you can see, it's in the, it's in the Amazon rainforest, but you, you start to see the patches of deforested land. Uh, as you can see, the little patches of so people clearing out the forest to plant monocrop cultures and extract the timber. So that's basically what communities like this in Ecuador and other countries of Latin America are faced with. They, uh, the only way to make an income is to cut the trees 
and to plant a monocrop culture or a monocrop culture or to have cattle. Uh, in this area, they cannot have cattle because jaguars are still around and they actually eat the cattle. So that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> but, but otherwise, they they uh, yeah they they still destroy the forest because that's what they've been taught for the last four decades, I think, or more. So this is these are pictures of how the community life looks like. Um, they're, they're people who want to send their kids to school, <laughs> like us. They've been very Western, Westernized, um, and and they need the resources to to send their kids to school to have a to buy food from the trucks because that's what they've been in the habit of doing instead of planting their own healthy food. So they, when we came four years ago, they used to spend 75, seven or to 75% of their income that they made from monocrop, uh, monocrop culture to buy food um, from a truck that would came from the Andes with you know, carrots and, and lettuce <laughs> and onions, which are products from the Andes and not from the Amazon. So um, they fell into the system, I guess. So lots of conflicts and pressures. Uh, as you probably uh, talk about with Ana Maria, uh, as the roads come to the Amazon, right? Immediately, immediately timber extraction uh, happens. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but, and then, and then cattle ranching starts uh, quickly. And then you can see here a picture of the Naranjilla fruit. It's a tropical fruit. It's a very, very harmful for the environment. They have to use a ton of fertilizer uh, chemical toxins to make it grow like that. And it's very harmful for human <laughs> consumption. Uh, and they, they have to apply it uh, various times a year to, to the, for them to have that kind of uh, crop or result. And then of course, mining, right? So lots and lots of mining in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and then, yeah, we have a very big illegal um, industry <laughs> for timber extraction. So it's not at all regulated in uh, governments <laughs> like ours in, in Ecuador. We say we are, but we're not. They, I, I know names and last names of people who extract wood at night um, when nobody sees them and, and basically police are paid <laughs> so for them too. And then it, it, it's understandable because a tree like that that you see here in the picture um, might, might give them up to $3,000 if they cut them in, into planks and sell them. So um, that's all the money they know how to get. So in, in the intermediaries for the Naranquilla are the only ones that come to these areas. So there's no really a lot of help from the, from the government to another provide another alternative. So basically these are the alternatives they have uh, to timber extraction or monocrop culture. So we created um, Humans for Abundance as a, as a a testing ground for an alternative way to make an income. So um, we thought that maybe local rest local people like like the ones that I'm presenting here to you in Rosita's community could we could sell e uh, ecological restoration as a service, uh, sort of like a, a graphic designer selling their their services uh, to to design a logo or something. They would sell the service of restoring the Amazon rainforest their own lands. Um, so this is what we're doing. We've been uh, selling eco actions <laughs> to to people from the global north, and those eco actions come into these communities, and so they can stop all these harmful activities that I just mentioned, and they can turn their farms around and actually start rescuing their ancestral knowledge um, and their identity, and actually start valuing what they knew before for th you know, thousands of years, uh, and rethinking or, or revaluing again that. What they what they used to know, uh, which was the way to keep the rainforest as a as a food garden, as a food forest, because they um, they used to grow the the Amazon thousands and thousands of people, millions of people, I think, it, that used to live in the Amazon um, for millennia, as I said, and harvesting and, and cropping trees that they didn't need and planting trees that they would need. So um, the most important treating the soil because it's, it's really bad soil for agriculture. So unless you have a forest intact, the, the water can go in and the minerals and the nutrients can stay in the soil. If you cut the trees, the soil is good for one or two years and then nothing grows because the rain just washes all the minerals away. 
uh, and all the nutrients. So um, this is a big problem in the Amazon because they, they've been instructed to clear the forests without knowing that they're killing their soils and the, the microbiome in the soils. So we started having uh, workshops with them, like new conversations about uh, um, how can they, they, could, they could turn into restorers uh, and become you know, proud entrepreneurs that offer this very important um, service to the world, which is to restore these essential forests that we need for our very survival. And we started talking about ecosystems with them and, and their own native language. And they scratched out <laughs> um, our very Western world uh, way of seeing an ecosystem like a, uh, as a system of you know, living beings. They scratched out the word and then uh, they, they put a better word or a phrase that says, uh, which means our living energy. So we started learning from them how they see themselves or humans as uh, a, just a tiny part of these of these forests and this living energy. They they see the energy in it. So uh, it was it was very inter interesting for us to to learn and to see this vision and to start uh, celebrating that. So they would value it <laughs> themselves uh, instead of valuing the Western ways as superior. So we started having these conversations with them and how we can uh, start applying this knowledge again into the chakra system, which they used to, they used to have before. So here it is, um, sorry, pictures of the proudest restorers um, doing a job that they actually like doing, which is restoring their forest and living in their forest, but actually making money from it. So, um, so as I said, the chakra system uh, that they used to have before, looks very different from monoculture crops. Here's a picture from up <laughs> from the satellite, from a drone, sorry. Uh, you can see different different trees that they're growing in the food forest and it doesn't look at all like a, a monocrop. Um, but we did have to, to do with them uh, lots of workshops on um, organic fertilizers. They didn't know how to, how to make them. Uh, so we had to kind of join um, their knowledge with Western knowledge um, and, and, and join forces really to rescue the chakra system, which is what they've been, been doing for millennia, right? Like planting, um, I don't know, up to 50 or more products in the same hectare instead of just one. Um, now, when we came four years ago, they did have only like five to 10 products. They had forgotten how to use the chakra system to the 100% uh, the of their potential. So now they're inserting more and more products and different um, layers. As you can see in this photo, there's like a, a, a bottom layer maybe with pineapples or, and then like a middle, middle layer with, with plantains and like maybe a top layer with, with some timber that they can extract later. So, um, so we started bringing experts in permaculture, uh, which are indigenous as well. <laughs> um, and they started teaching them how to harvest uh, microorganisms for their own forests, uh, collect those microorganisms and put them in soil and reproduce them so to re recover the graded soils that uh, basically have killed the microorganisms by using fertilizer. So how to reinsert these microorganisms back into the soil. So this is what we've been working. Um, and then you can see here, uh, Jose, with his chakra on the back, right? And you can see how it looks totally different from, from a typical coffee plantation, for example. Um, and here you can see how he's learned to use um, the polyculture system and where three economic activities or three economic products are mixed together in the same plot of land. So he has his coffee plantation. These are coffee plants. It's completely organic. And he uses the chickens to fertilize the soil and they clean, they clean the soil underneath the coffee. But he also has some chuncho trees, you cannot see here, but uh, trees that he would extract later for timber. Uh, they've been there for 10 years. So he's not mixing three and four, four commercial products at the same time. So instead of having a monoculture crop, now he's selling his chickens to his neighbors. He's consuming the eggs. His family's nutrition has gone up. His finances have gone up, uh, and then he, the production of the coffee is really, really good. 
he has a delicious coffee that is organic and is sustainable and doesn't kill the soil. So um, it's been really, really successful seeing them apply this, reapply this and being proud. And as I, as I mentioned before, they learn how to do the agriculture in the Amazon because you can't, in the Amazon, you just can't dig a hole and just plant things. You have to create beds uh, or elevated beds with biochar. So um, I'm sure you'll talk about Terra Preta <laughs> with Ana Maria, um, but basically it's creating uh, uh, charcoal in a, in a very specific way that uses very little oxygen. So uh, um, it's very sustainable. And then it, it uh, conserves all the carbon inside the biochar. So it doesn't really carbon into the atmosphere, it conserves the carbon and it creates a very rich environment for the microbiome. So then you collect, you harvest microbiome from and, and find fungi from the forest that they still have and they mix it with this biochar and then you make these beds. And that's how they keep, um, that's how they're planting their food forests again, like bringing back the um, very rich soil into the degraded land. Um, I think that, I don't know, that's it. <laughs> that's all, uh, if you have any questions, or I don't know if the questions go at the end. That was wonderful, Chochi. Thank you so much. Uh, our plan is to do the questions uh, after the three of you speak. I don't know whether you had a chance to listen to Catalina, maybe. A little bit, yeah. And, the, and we have, uh, let me see if Teresa is here already. That's incredible. And, and hopefully, Chochi, my students will be able to see Mushudakta very soon. So they will be visiting you guys very soon. We have, let me see. Okay. Are you there? Mm, I don't see Teresa among the participants. I wonder whether she had issues connecting. Hola. There she is, Teresa, un gusto. Hola. Bienvenida. Eh, entonces, I, I was thinking, Chochi, if you don't mind eh, stopping, please. Exactly, perfect. So now we can see you, Teresa. Teresa is a Schwar. Eh, correct me if I'm wrong, Teresa. Eh, a Schwar scientist who has been like um, the Kichwa with whom uh, Chochi works with, has been doing uh, ecological restoration projects for about 20 years, if I'm not wrong, Teresa. It's the first time that I have the pleasure to meet her. Eh, you will be, tú si nos vas a dar la conferencia en español y tranquila, Teresa, yo lo que voy a hacer es eh, traducir lo que vas diciendo en el chat, porque sí. la mayoría de los estudiantes que están aquí no hablan español, pero no importa, yo te apoyo con la traducción para que tú hables tranquila. Ahora, ¿quieren compartir la pantalla a ustedes? ¿O quieren que yo comparta la pantalla y vaya cambiando los, las diapositivas? Sí recibí la, 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 la presentación que me enviaste por Facebook. Sí, eso era sí, por era. si acaso. Tal vez podemos ah, desde acá. Ya, perfecto. Entonces déjame asegurarme, Teresa, de que, puedes... que todo funcione. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo apareces aquí? ¿Bajo qué nombre? Para encontrarte, asegurarme que seas... Chiqui. Te puedo ver. Como Chiqui, a ver. Quiero asegurarme que puedas compartir la pantalla. Ya te encontré. Sí, porque estás ahorita como que... A ver, te voy a poner acá. Co-host, por si acaso. ¿No deberías tener ningún problema? ¿Quieres intentarlo? Ya. Yeah. Perfecto. Y bienvenida, Teresa. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Y, y, y for the students, I will be inserting the translation into English. Please, I apologize in advance because translating from... Spanish into English is very difficult for me. I'm not as good as Google Translate. <laughs> the AI is better by far, but I'll do my best. Listo, Teresa, muchas gracias. Yo voy a apagar mi micrófono y voy a estar escribiendo acá. Yeah. Ya, yeah, estamos intentando. Momento. ¿Sí ven la pantalla? No. No, no todavía. Ah, uh, ya. Yeah. Por lo que veo, deberían poder compartirla. Vamos mirando aquí. Voy a intentar de nuevo. Desktop one. A ver. 
compartir, abrir preferencias. No sé, no, no está funcionando. ¿No está funcionando? O no sabemos cómo hacerlo. A ver, aquí hay un icono que dice Share Screen, que está sí. justo en la línea de abajo. Ahí si la aplastas, ¿qué te sale? Debería, debería salirte otra imagen con, con tu pantalla y le puedes dar un clic en esa, donde nos ves a nosotros. Sí, solo que no sale así. No, no sé. No te está saliendo así. Qué raro. Um, ¿Quieres, ¿Quieres que la comparta yo? Yo creo que sí. No, y no es así tan detallado ni tan organizado. Más es para las fotos que Teresa quiere mostrar al grupo. A ver, aquí está. Me enviaste la presentación. Es, si no me equivoco, no, no es esta. Mm, downloads, déjame abrirla acá. Eh, me enviaste dos, ¿verdad? Así. Sí, eh, uno está en Keynote, otro está en PowerPoint. A ver. Perdón, estoy aquí mirando. List. Tururú. Charla de Tere para Ana Key. Y acá la otra es Charla de Tere para Ana PowerPoint. ¿Quieres la que está en PowerPoint, Teresa? Lo que más fácil sea para sí, abrir. abrir. Ya, entonces lo voy a abrir en PowerPoint. Ya la estoy abriendo. Sí. Apenas esté abierta, la voy a compartir. Ok, acá está. Perfecto. Entonces aquí debería ser capaz de compartir esto. Ok, can someone let me know if you can see the screen now? Correcto. Ok, perfecto. Entonces yo voy a, ahora lo que no veo es el chat, entonces no voy a poder traducir, no, acá está el chat. Si abro el chat, ¿lo ven también? ¿Molesta esto? No hay problema. Ya, lo que voy a hacer acá es eh, ponerle en formato de presentación, ya no he usado PowerPoint en años, es acá, ¿verdad? Acá. Ok. Y voy a mantener el chat acá para poder... Um... Listo. Ok. Listo, Teresa. Ya, yeah, ok. Um, bueno, gracias, Anita, por compartir con todos y para todos los oyentes también, ¿no? Ya, yeah, a mí me toca el tema de Shuar Aja. Ya. Yeah. Eh, Shuar Aja es un lugar, un espacio donde que las mujeres deciden el lugar, el sitio para poder ver y es un lugar limitado, no es como para destruir todo el bosque, no es como para poder ayudar ¿no? en la parte muy primordial, especialmente en lo que es la sobrevivencia en la cultura de nosotras, ¿no? El Ahashuar consiste antes y después, ya. Yeah. Consiste de que es primero el Campundín, ya, yeah. es la selva donde que todas las mujeres se reúnen en busca de materiales para encontrar cerámicas para poder hacer las cerámicas entonces ahí van pues dentro del bosque colectan algunas muchas plantas porque hay un bosque que es el campundín no campundín es es tierra tariñat y nunca en donde quiero decirles de que campundín es selva grande y tierra de los ancestros Así lo concebimos, ¿no? El Aja Shuar, Shuar Aja, decimos, ¿no? Ambos partes podemos decirlo, tomarlo como hacemos, ¿no? Consiste en que 
es una huerta donde que ya, a ver, en el proceso, hacemos la aja, es la huerta donde que nosotros estamos queriendo sembrar, seleccionado el lugar, el espacio, sembramos los tubérculos, o sea, ahí hay todas las especies, las variedades que tenemos, la, en especial también las plantas que han sido ya, eh, eh, muchas de las veces las plantas son silvestres, ¿no? Y son domesticadas por las mujeres, en especial porque las mujeres son especialmente los que se seleccionan las semillas dentro como del bosque y del huerto también, ¿no? El ajashuar es una huerta sagrada, ¿no? Sagrada decimos porque ahí se cultivan con la sabiduría de nuestros ancestros, de nuestras madres, abuelas. Y ellos son los que nos transmiten el saber con todo el anen, con los ritos sagrados, para poder nosotros que todas las plantas cultivadas sean muy fructíferos para que den mucha, mu mucha comida o, o tengan muchas hojas para las verduras, porque mayormente son plantas que realmente traemos del bosque primario. Cuando hacemos la huerta a Hashuar, nosotros colectamos, domesticamos y cultivamos en esta parte en la huerta. Ya la mayor parte son ya domesticadas, que ya se manejan en el huerto en Shuar Aja. Aja puede, se entiende también Aja Shuar donde que se imparten los saberes y los conocimientos en el manejo de los huertos, en el manejo de las semillas. Como decir, nuestras abuelas son a guardianes de las semillas porque ellos lo guardan las semillas selección nos enseñan a seleccionar las semillas para poder sembrar para los tiempos que ya vienen en la época de la siembra Ajashuar también es un lugar llamado donde que nuestro um, las mamás preparamos la Ajashuar para poder de que allí van a venir nuevas futuras generaciones. Es como decir, el Shuar Aja es donde que viene un bebé que va a nacer en la huerta, donde se cultivan las plantas para poder dar de alimentar a nuestros hijos y también para sanar nuestros males. Entonces, tenemos muchas diversidades de plantas para poder sanar cuando necesitamos poder usar las plantas, como decir, las plantas medicinales, plantas comestibles, plantas que son de uso cosmético, plantas de muchas especies. La mujer Schwar colecta todo tipo de plantas. Puede ser tóxicas plantas que realmente son utilizadas para otro dado, para usos, en especialmente para animales, para el ser humano y también se cultivan plantas para dar de comer a otros, los animales que los domestican. Entonces, Ajashuar es un lugar, un espacio donde que la nueva generación nace y ya empieza a emprender sus actividades diarias y cotidianas. ¿Ya? Y podemos cambiar también. El... Eh, si puede poner el siguiente. Siguiente. Sí. Ahí está. Bueno. Aquí ¿Una más? Es... Sí, ahí estamos hablando. Ahí está una madre donde que ella enseña a sus nietos dentro de la selva, está colectando semillas, está transmitiendo sus saberes, son nietos que realmente reciben ¿no? los saberes de la abuela. Entonces, eso, los saberes ancestrales son transmitidos de padres a hijos y a nietos. Entonces, eso es lo que le practica 
las mamás abuelas. Y podemos ver también allí en la huerta, cultivando y está también sacando las plantas para poder usarlos cuando ya hay necesidad, puede ser de una enfermedad, ya están esos ya cultivados en la huerta, pero es la facilidad de cultivar en la huerta es para poder dar el uso cuando se necesiten las plantas. Entonces, ahí eh, vemos que también eh, la mamá saca el tubérculo. Podemos ver otra foto más también ahí que tenemos. Es la selección de semillas. Son plantas que son primitivas, que yo estoy viendo ahí la mamá, abuela, está sacando, seleccionando para seguir sembrando en otras huertas, como decir, y aguardar las semillas que realmente seleccionadas, ¿no? Normalmente, ¿quién es la que selecciona el lugar, el espacio para hacer la huerta? Ajashuar. Son las mujeres mismo que seleccionan y después de la selección, ellos diseñan, ellas diseñan la huerta. ¿Dónde van a cultivar las plantas? Estas plantas medicinales, estas plantas comestibles, estas plantas que son de uso emergente. Entonces, es diseñada por las mismas mujeres que ellos van a dar el uso y tener muy cerca las plantas. Bueno, la ajashuar es una actividad diaria. Y también la actividad cotidiana de todos los niños y de todas las mamás, de todas las abuelas que ya se vienen haciendo hace miles de años. ¿Ya? Entonces, viene sembrando todo tipo de plantas. Colectando y sembrando todo tipo de plantas. En especial, dando la garantía es la alimentación diaria. ¿Ya? Especialmente cultivando los tubérculos para que los niños puedan consumir en la huerta. La mujer Schwarz se dedica mucho en implementar múltiples especies, tanto como frutales, tanto como tubérculos, que los niños puedan, en el momento que están limpiando la huerta, en el momento que están cosechando, los niños, los jóvenes, las mamás, las abuelas están disfrutando comiendo todos los frutos que producen en la huerta, en Ajashuar. Hace muchos años, antiguamente, el Ajashuar está representado en diferentes formas y maneras de cómo poder, de cómo poder manejar estas especies. ¿Ya? Porque la mujer Shuar es la... Eh, desempeña un papel muy importante que alimenta a toda la familia, es muy sabia, conoce las plantas o los frutos que van a dar en seis meses y los frutos que van a dar al año. Entonces, son diferentes variedades y especies que realmente que cultivan es para que no les falte el alimento en la casa, en la familia. Entonces, también la mujer Schwartz tiene una conexión, una conexión con el Anen de la Madre Tierra. Ya hace el Anen y enseña a sus nietos y también comparte, ¿no? Este Anen sagrado es compartido con las mujeres en la huerta. Ya para poder que las semillas no se pierdan y también las semillas comparten. Cuando una persona necesita y el otro puede recuperar otras semillas que realmente se lo, a veces se lo pierden porque no lo cultivan. Pero sí. siempre es compartido el ajashuar. Explica que Anen es un canto. El Anen es un grito sagrado. Es para poder... Dar gracias cuando hay mucha cosecha, hay en abundancia. Es la niña Nungui, la diosa 
que protege a la madre tierra y el bosque. Tal vez quieres cantar, Manuel. Ya. Bueno, también ahí es un lugar, el Ajashuar es un lugar donde que se reúnen todas las mujeres mayores, reunidas a las hijas, a los hijos, a los jóvenes, y ahí con el Anen, enseñando el Anen, comparten la sabiduría, transmitiendo el Anen, utilizando este tabaco, utilizando otras plantas y dándoles de beber, porque ellos cultivan muchas plantas en las huertas. Entonces, ahí es el momento donde que se hace el Anen de la, de la niña Nungui. Le podría un poquito nomás a, a el Anen de la niña Nungui para dar gracias por toda la cosecha, por toda la abundancia que nos ha dado el año. Nungui no va, va, Nungui no va, va, huetia anen dururta, huetia anen dururta, ame o chirmeca, huetia anen dururta, huetia anen dururta, natanda na huetipia, natanda na huetipia. Esa es una súplica que se da a la niña Nungui, la madre protectora del bosque y de la madre tierra. Se pide para que la tierra no se canse, para que nosotros no sienta que el ser humano que cultiva no sienta que está maltratando a la madre tierra, porque él, ella lo siente, lo siente y nosotros podemos sentir. Entonces, todo en el momento que se siembra, se, se, hay, que, hay que bendecir, como decir, das gracias por la niña Nungu y las semillas, todas las semillas que colectas para cultivarlo. Tiene que, de, de, tenemos que dar ben, eh, gracias a, a la niña Nungu que nos da esta oportunidad para poder cultivarlo. Entonces, eso es muy importante por ejemplo, como les decía de que el huerto, el Ajashuar, es donde que un niño ya nace en el huerto. Ya la huerta es sagrada, es consagrada totalmente. Cualquiera no puede entrar sin el permiso de otra persona, porque ahí están las plantas sagradas, plantas que son alucinógenas, plantas que curan de los males del cuerpo. Entonces, por eso es tan eh, eh, cuidada y protegida los huertos de Ajashuar. Entonces, es muy importante conocer también para nosotros cómo las mujeres nos enseñan, en mi cultura, las mujeres mayores nos enseñan cómo colectar las plantas, cómo domesticar las plantas, como que el huerto que tú ya lo hiciste muchos años cortando los árboles, que las raíces se regeneren por sí solo, haya una regeneración natural, se cultivan plantas, como decir, cuando ya se cansa la tierra, lo cultivan otras plantas como palmas, como guavas, como caimitos, como otras plantas para que ellos den frutos y con el tiempo del cambio, que en unos años ya van a buscar otro espacio, ya es para no maltratar o no tener el espacio hoy mismo eh, sembrando y no tenemos buena cosecha. Entonces hay que dejarlo descansar, hay que buscar otro espacio sin destruirlo. Entonces la cosmovisión de la mujer Shuar es no dejar de que las personas puedan ir, entrar y cortar, destruir y botar las semillas. Entonces, en, en la cosmovisión de nosotros, de la mujer Shuar, es, ellos tienen las semillas, ellos son los guardianes de las semillas, ellos tienen las semillas especialmente para poder guardar por mucho tiempo y así no, pues, eh, que falte los alimentos a la familia, y si hay otras personas que lo necesitan, 
se lo da a las semillas para que pueda cultivar y pueda alimentar a su familia sin destruir el bosque. Eso y alguna otra pregunta tal vez es muy importante. Ahorita un poco una pequeña de, de integración, ¿no? Que el Ajashuar también es un lugar de la familia para integrarse ahí, reunirse, hablar de los sueños, hablar de lo que quiere planificar, qué es lo que quiere hacer para hacer una huerta, no destruir el bosque, sino utilizarlo lo que tú vas a poder aprovecharlo. Eso nomás, gracias. Yo les agradezco mucho, Anita, por, por tomarme en cuenta. Muchas gracias a ti, querida Teresa, por estar hoy con nosotros. Muy, muy lindo. Me encantó escuchar tu, tu canto, tu Aint. Precioso. Gracias, gracias por compartir el Aint con, con todos. Eh, muy especial. Y ahora... A ver, ¿cómo hacemos esto desde la perspectiva del lenguaje? Tenemos a Catarina, que habla español perfecto, y la Chochi. Entonces, quizás esta sección la hacemos en español, Teresa, y yo te ayudo traduciendo al inglés para que te puedan entender los estudiantes. Y si es que hacen preguntas, te las traduzco a ti al español. ¿Does yeah. anyone have questions for Catarina, Chochi, Teresa, who are here? You can ask in English and I'll help you translate with Teresa. Um, I, have, for her. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Anna. Um, if you could translate it, uh, that would be great. I'm curious about the cycles of harvest and rest for the forest and um, kind of like more, more details on potentially like how often those happen and when it gets decided that they happen. Um, básicamente, Teresa, lo que le interesa a Giovanna es saber un poco más sobre los ciclos de cosecha y de descanso. Quisiera saber cuándo ocurren, cómo deciden, eh, cómo, cómo, cómo generan esta rotación, digamos. Ya. Yeah. Esto hacen las mujeres que diseñan su huerto. Ya, yeah. la huerta especialmente que va a dar eh, cultivo de corto ciclo. Tenemos, que dan en seis meses. Ya los productos producen seis meses. Se siembra todos los tubérculos que van a, a dar cosecha en seis meses. Ya. Y esos son mayormente son lianas, bejucos, tubérculos que se cosechan en los seis meses. Ya. Hay yucas que dan en seis meses. Una variedad de yucas. Se le selecciona. Estaba hablando de la selección de semillas, ¿no? Ya cuando haces tu huerto, tienes un huerto que realmente cultiva de todo. Hay un huerto especialmente para, eh, como decimos nosotros, para matar el hambre, para tener que cosechar más rápido. Entonces son los tubérculos y yucas y plátano es para un año. Por ejemplo, ahí está en otro huerto, son para productos que dan un año. Por ejemplo, el plátano da un año, los guineos, el orito, todo eso está en un año. ¿ya? Por ejemplo, en seis meses, antes de seis meses o de tres meses, algunos, el maíz, el choclo, hay variedades de especies, como decíamos, variedades de semillas. Entonces, por eso, eso solamente las mamás, abuelas, saben seleccionar y nos enseñan a seleccionar y sembrar en el huerto de corto ciclo. Pero creo que quieres saber en qué tiempo dejas en bosque y otra vez ya, haces la charla. Eso, eso. Pero esto como es de seis meses, ya se cosechó y se deja. Y después puedes cambiar otro. En los seis meses que tú ya cosechas, ya se remonta. Y ya hasta eso, a los seis meses, hay frutos que dan en seis meses, como la guava, otras especies. Entonces la semilla los botas en el, en el huerto que ya, ya aprovechaste. Entonces ya en pocos, en los, antes de los seis meses eso ya va a estar ya rondoso un bosque secundario. Y ahí mismo ya cargan algunos frutos. Eh, a ver, Teresa, para poder traducir en, en resumen, o sea, tú tienes estas dos tipos de huertas principales, la de seis meses y la de un año. Pero una vez que has cosechado la de seis, ya empiezas a plantar otras variedades que le reactivan, pero de otra manera. Sí, de otros otra frutos. forma. Sí, poniéndole, especialmente ahí lo que se busca son 
por ejemplo, plantas que son que leguminosas más que todo ya, las guavas, ya oh, porque... Dios. Las, las guavas y sembramos esto, muchas, muchas plantas, como decir, también sembramos chontaduro en, en, en cantidad, sembramos eh, un guragua, morrete, porque ya esos son árboles, ya esos crecen rápido, ¿no? Entonces, hay algunos que sembramos copales, que también son ricos los frutos que se comen, ¿no? Hay algunos avíos. Son diferentes variedades que tú tienes que ver que eso tiene que remontarse, ¿ya? Entonces, no escaseas porque ya cose cosechaste eso en los seis meses, no mueren totalmente rapidito, pero poco a poco, poco a poco ya va desapareciendo las plantas y todo, pero ya va remontando. Entonces, ya no es maltratarle al suelo, destruirle al suelo de que realmente solamente yo he visto que las personas que no cultivan ni nada, eso va a permanecer solo hierbas, pero va a ser lento para crecer. Pero si siembras otras plantas, va a crecer muy rápido, ¿ya? Perfecto. Another question, comment. It's interesting also, I think that we have had, you know, three fascinating visions, very different perspectives of a space that has something in common. I mean, the chakra, you know, it's this uh, common pool resource, if you wish, of the, of the Quichua, this community garden that also is sacred. Um, the Shuar Teresa has spoken firsthand from the perspective of a woman who who plants chakras in her territory. And we've also heard Katarina, who's been looking at the rubber tapers and their common pooling of resources and their communal management of land uh, in Brazil. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, rubber tapers can also be settlers and migrants into Amazonia. But it feels that there's something common between these three examples that we're looking at. And maybe it would be interesting to, you know, try to find out a little bit more about how that works. Would you be interested? Any questions? Yes, Peter? Yeah, I have a question for maybe more towards Katarina and uh, Chochi, but um, questions around like, what are, like, what are the, some of the biggest challenges in terms of, I don't know, I think in the studio we've been thinking of sort of like uh, um, two systems, which is like, semi subsistence, but also um, semi capitalistic. So like um, income derived or prosperity derived from uh, pooled resources. So, um, but then also um, prosperity from uh, the land itself. So I guess um, for uh, Katarina, maybe the first question is like, what are, what are some of the best strategies or methods towards actually ensuring prosperity from The, um, from the land, like stays within the community and isn't just like, um, doesn't leave the community through like manufacturing or exporting these goods um, in the case of rubber in a sense. And then I guess in the other, um, yeah, maybe I should just start there. Maybe I should just start there. Um, sorry, Joji. but yeah. Hi. Um Yes, yeah, so let me see. So the question is that um, whether basically, so you mean by when you say about the value staying in the community, uh, do you mean in terms of their um, socioeconomic development or do you mean in terms of um, just being uh, separated from the external world? I mean, um, how, like, What if, like, what, what in your research, what have you discovered has been like effective, uh, like effective structures for the people who are actually producing the plants to like maintain the profits from their production, um, so that they they actually can have wealth and it isn't just being lost, and so then they can educate their children yeah. and things like this. Mm -hmm. Does that make okay, sense? no, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I just didn't understand at first. No, I think that's really interesting. So they. I mean, the short answer is that they haven't found many solutions. So they've tried a number of different things, uh, but they haven't found the solutions because what they produce 
um, depends on external buyers, like everything. And um, it is so they have tried to set up cooperatives. There are quite a few external projects, both international and national and regional, to help them um, develop the systems and being able to trade all of that. But it is it is very difficult. So they haven't found a solution. That's why they are diversifying now. And some of that diversification is not necessarily good for the environment. Um, but yes, it is it is tricky. Mm. A mí me, me encantaría preguntarle a Teresa cómo definen los Shua la propiedad, cómo se concibe la propiedad en la cosmovisión Shua. En la cosmovisión Shua nosotros no somos dueños de nada en nuestros terrenos. Ya, yeah. nosotros no somos dueños de nada, ni de las plantas, ni del sitio, aunque así nosotros quedamos en el sitio, en el lugar. Lo que la madre naturaleza nos da un espacio es nuestra cosmovisión es aprovechar de una manera equitativa. ¿Ya? Aprovechar eh, de que esos saberes, nuestros saberes se transmitan de uno, de padres a nietos, a hijos. ¿Ya? Las, los mayores son que desempeñan un papel muy importante para educar. La educación parte mucho de la, de la mujer, Schwar, parte la educación a la hija y el hombre tiene que dar la formación al hombre como debe. No, el hombre es art, um, artístico para poder diseñar su casa, para construir la casa. A eso él está preparado a hacer eso, pero asimismo nosotros... Nuestra cosmovisión es el diseño de la huerta, la mujer, ya ella es la que está no encargada, sino nosotros somos, lo, como decir, para, no, para proteger al mismo tiempo, no, no queremos destruir. Por eso antiguamente nuestro, nuestros antepasados venían en un lugar para colectar la semilla, los años que viven ahí, comen y lo siembran, lo dejan en sus huertos. Y eso quiere decir que Nuestros hijos, ¿por qué en el sal nace en el huerto un bebé? Ya, y ese huerto, ese lugar donde que está cultivado, tiene mucha representación dentro de la cosmovisión mítica de nosotros, la cosmovisión mítica de las plantas y la conexión el hombre. Entonces, esa es nuestra cosmovisión, es repoblar nuevamente el bosque que hemos utilizado pero el anen dando gracias a la, a la que es la dueña protectora que tenemos a la niña Nungui como la diosa, que nos ayuda, que no podemos, tenemos que destruir, destrozar el bosque. Eso es nuestra cosmovisión, ya, y no dañar el, el entorno nuestro, porque esa es nuestra vida, ahí está nuestra salud, nuestra alimentación y nuestro, el mejor vivir en armonía, con la madre naturaleza, es la cosmovisión. Y, y querida Teresa, si es que el conocimiento es lo más importante, ¿no es cierto?, en el mundo shuar, el conocimiento que se transmite de a la abuela, a la hija, a la nieta, a los nietos, a los hijos, ¿cómo se sienten los, las nacionalidades de la Amazonía eh, compartiendo esos conocimientos? ¿Los quieren compartir? ¿Los quieren proteger? ¿Se han sentido desposeídos o les interesa que otros, que los colonos, los mestizos, los, los, los otros, digamos, aprendan también de ese conocimiento, de cómo vivir y cómo ser guardianes y eh, cuidadores de la selva y no destructores? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo te sientes con respecto a eso? ¿Cómo se sienten otros Shuar y otras nacionalidades? Yo lo que podría decir es que no todos, no todos estamos eh, conscientes de esto, de impartir el conocimiento cuando es de sembrar, impartir las semillas. Eso no es un problema, eso no es un problema, pero para otras culturas es problema y para nosotros qué mejor sería bueno ¿no? compartir esos saberes, esos conocimientos 
para aprender a seleccionar nuestras semillas del bosque, como nuestras abuelas, ellos fueron los guardianes de las semillas, de diferentes formas, yo no digo solo de pepas, puede ser semilla de tubérculo, porque ellos tienen, son sabias, no es cualquiera el que está en el monte, escoge las semillas buenas, para traer y domesticar, para dar el uso, reproducir esta semilla, para que otros sigan de generación a generación, los hijos que puedan aprovechar. Pero en las otras culturas estamos muy cerrados. ¿Qué quiero decir eso? Hay egoísmo también. Ya muchas de las culturas están entrando en eso porque realmente para mí si es de cultivar, sembrar, todas estas cosas, enseñar cómo poder eh, repoblar las especies, para mí no sería mezquino, ¿no? Yo puedo decir eso. Se podría hacer eso no solamente los indígenas, todos, ¿no? ahí no vemos ni el color, ni el blanco, ni nada, porque en este planeta que ahorita estamos, ya viendo todos los cambios que hay en el mundo, estamos sintiéndolo. Si no lo hacemos eso, ya venimos nosotros desde muchas futuras generaciones, no hemos hecho nada. Y que no estamos haciendo nada, absolutamente nada, solo estamos sacando, 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 y nadie está educando, nadie está formando. Más que todo en el país, en Ecuador, no hay una buena formación, una buena educación, no hay para poner conciencia. Eso falta mucho, la educación sale en parte de las comunidades, en parte de la familia, eso es muy importante, eso falta mucho en las comunidades, que no se capacitan. Ya apenas es un taller, pero un poquito. No llegan a los estudiantes porque ellos son el futuro. No llegan a las escuelas porque ellos son el futuro. Eso es lo, lo penoso que realmente que hoy estamos viviendo en el mundo global. Es más bien estamos viendo la destrucción de nuestro planeta. Y bueno, yo a mi parecer pienso de que todos tenemos que aunar y poner una semilla, aunar el esfuerzo, pues para poder ver las mejores nuestro planeta. Muy bien. No, increíbles las tres presentaciones. Ahora yo no quiero abusar del tiempo. I don't want to abuse their time. The three presentations have been incredible, um, extremely fruitful, I think, for all of us. If someone else has maybe one last question, and then we, we can let... Um, Catarina and uh, Chochi and Teresa go to eat dinner. Well, Catarina almost breakfast. <laughs> Anyone? One last question? Eh, please, oh. Rachaya. Uh, uh, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I don't sorry uh, maybe this is more uh to pochi um just wanted I, i'm very fascinated with the uh, strategy and i think it might be some um possible applications in in many places i wonder um how uh the restoration of these um areas work or to what extent uh, the the site could be restored for example are these sites uh, uh, just vacant sites or um, contaminated for example or um, it was urbanized i i i think yeah i i wonder how how the system works and also how that a portion of restoring resources and also um making income versus uh, the portion of uh, their own use yeah so um the the idea with the startup is that many kinds of uh, restoration projects can participate so even from the most degraded one to the the one i presented in Shudakta, which is not too degraded yet so they've cleared forests but the soils are not completely damaged and the, the reserve, the national park is right there. So the for, that forest can come back completely, completely, because uh, besides 
from for the species that the humans will bring that we are introducing uh, and assisted uh, restoration is called. The birds will bring some more and the other animals will bring some more seeds and, and, and complete the ecosystem. Uh, but there are some other lands that take years, 20 years or more to, to restore. So it's hard work and it's the only thing you have to do all day is go find the seeds, propagate the seeds, have a little nursery, um, treat the soil. Sometimes if the land is very, very degraded, it takes more than two years to just uh, restore the soil and the microorganisms in the soil. So uh, it, it does take a few years to restore depending on, on what you're doing, how degraded the land is. But the idea is that any, any restoration project can work. And even if it's not restoration, any action that results in the restoration or conservation of the, of the forest, or any other ecosystem, because sometimes we have uh, paramo ecosystems, which are really, really important also for the world, but they're not for us. So our idea is to, to incentivize people to, to turn into this activity or, or, or turn their lives around so they can actually do this activity and receive a payment, as you said. So that's why we're uh, kind of being a channel or a bridge between these people who can do the restoration and the people who, who wants to do the restoration but can't move to the Amazon or can't move to the Paramo because they don't know how to do the restoration. They don't know anything about that ecosystem, but they actually want to restore it. So uh, connecting these, those two people, we call them restorers and core restorers. So they do, they join forces and they restore that piece of land. And that's how they make an income. Um, so that's a, that's how money is coming into them, uh, to the community that we're working. Now, it depends on how many core restorers um, know about this and decide to support this, that we can expand to other communities. So we want to, we don't want to expand to many communities and promise them an income and then have two or three people paying, right? And it's not enough. So it's, it, it's a matter of finding a balance of, of growth, right? And scaling up little by little as more core restorers find out, then we grow to more communities and more, more ideas of, of equal actions. I don't know if I answered your question. Oh yeah, thank you so much. It's, yeah, it's very helpful. But uh, uh, gracias, Teresa. Thank you, Catarina. Thank you all thank for you. being here. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Great presentations as well. Bye, Teresa. Adios. Un abrazo. Gracias, gracias. Bye, Ana. Gracias. Bye, bye. Bye, bye.